Good afternoon, class. Um, today we're going to continue to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, and I hope uh, we're going to start transitioning into more into what was traditionally called optics, even though optics is really just light, and that's the electro and that's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's just a little bit of a transition from uh, our discussion of microwaves and things like that into what we'll call optics. And I'm hoping we can actually wrap up optics maybe tomorrow, maybe Wednesday, and then by Friday start talking about electricity, which is uh, some fun stuff and it provides for some um, fun things to do in class. Um, we've been talking about the electromagnetic spectrum for a while. Um, one thing that I don't know if I've said explicitly, I want to make sure uh, I say today, is that so we've talked about the fact that all photons are identical, basically. The only thing that the only difference is their wavelength and frequency. And all you have to do is know one to know the other. Because the product of wavelength and frequency is always constant, the speed of light. That's universal constant in our universe. So if I just told you the wavelength of a wave, you would know its frequency. And that's about all you need to know about waves uh, or about photons. The one thing that I don't know if I've said explicitly is that another thing that also changes when you change the wavelength or frequency of a wave is the energy. And so a good definition of a photon is a little packet of energy. Energy from back several weeks ago is the ability to do work. And so right now, if you are seeing me, that's because energy is entering your eye and enabling chemical reactions in the back of your eye. So you've got a bunch of cells in the back of your eye that are just sitting around waiting for a chemical reaction to occur. Chemical, re chemical reactions can occur when you provide enough energy. And so right now, the rods and cones in the back of your eye are being lit up by little packets of energy called photons that are hitting you in the eye and setting off these chemical reactions. So anytime you've ever been hit by a photon, that's a little packet of energy. The energy of photons goes up as you increase in frequency or decrease in wavelength. The energy goes up on this picture up here. The energy goes up as you go over to the right. And so that's why radio waves aren't particularly scary. They're very low energy waves. So right now, in this room, every AM and FM station in the area is passing through your body. And that's not scary because those are low energy waves. There's a low enough energy that they're probably not going to do anything as they pass through you. They are electromagnetic waves, so they will jiggle your electrons a little bit. But most electrons can handle a little jiggling and no problem. As you go further into the infrared, we get into, well, we get into microwaves. And we see that microwaves are actually on this side of the spectrum. So they're actually pretty low energy waves. That's why microwaves aren't particularly scary. But we do need to be careful about microwaves because they, have, they also have the ability to heat us up. And if you heat you up faster than you can dissipate said heat, that can be a problem. That can even have health effects if you were to do enough of it. So you wouldn't want to heat yourself up too much. But that's really what's all that's really the, the danger of a microwave. It's low energy waves. It just might heat you up. And you might you want to be careful about that. Then higher energy than than microwaves is visible light. So visible light also has some energy, but it's not able to do that much. But once you get into the ultraviolet, those last those last couple sets of rays, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma ray, are very energetic waves. And those actually are dangerous. And here's one reason I bring that up. As your instructor for the semester, I'm trying to every now and then give you a public service announcement like, don't hold your phone next to your head too long, and don't go outside when it's too sunny. I'm just going to apologize. I might, it might be visibly evident right now that I spent all day outside yesterday, and I did not adhere to my own uh, advice. I am a little bit burned right now. so. I feel, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm, uh, the redness in my face right now is about half embarrassment and half sunburn. And so I'm just going to apologize. Do not take my example as the way to go. Uh, it's dangerous. Don't do that. That's bad. I just was outside all day. I didn't, uh, it was dumb. So, um, and I, I, it's, it's kind of funny, but I, I really don't want to make a laughing matter out of it. Uh, it's dangerous stuff. So your DNA is something valuable to you. You should cherish your own DNA, and you should try not to damage your DNA. And so these photons, these photons in the UV and the X-ray and the gamma, those are called ionizing radiation. 
That's called ionizing radiation, meaning they have enough energy that when that photon enters your body, it has enough energy to ionize some atoms. In other words, to knock electrons off. You can think of your body as the most amazing chemical setup ever made. It's definitely by far the most amazing thing you've ever come in encounter with. Uh, if you were to just read about any particular chemical reaction in your body, just read about how eyesight works. Just read about how the photon that goes in your eye kicks off like 60 some chemical reactions and your brain goes, hey, that's a stop sign. It's an amazing process. Or how blood clotting works. Or anything, your, your body is just a, an amazing process of, of chemical reactions. It's also an amazing uh, storage of data, of information. So my DNA is information about me and enables my body to continue to grow uh, and so I can live as hopefully a nice long life. When I let photons come into my body and ionize my cells, ionize the atoms in my cells, I am asking for trouble. And so I am enabling chemical reactions that aren't supposed to happen, and I'm possibly damaging DNA. And so typically people sometimes categorize it as UVA, UVB, UVC. You may have seen that. Uh, like these glasses block UVB or something like that. Those are just subdivisions inside the UV spectrum. So UVA, go who's go, is just, just beyond purple. And then UVB is beyond that, and UVC is beyond that. Um, our, our atmosphere, I've mentioned this before, does a good job of protecting us against some of that. UVC is the most energetic. That's getting over there closer to the x-ray side of things. Our atmosphere is pretty opaque to that stuff, thankfully. I don't know if life, on, uh, I don't know if life ever would have arisen on the surface of the Earth without that kind of protection. So our, our planet is constantly bombarded with these dangerous waves. Uh, the, the really nasty ones are almost completely blocked out by the atmosphere. Now UVB, which is a little shorter, little longer wavelength, little less energetic, but still ionizing, ener uh, ionizing level energy, that does make it down to the surface, and we need to be careful about that. And so you can get burned, and a burn means you've damaged your body, and your body is reacting to that damage. Or uh, you can get a tan, which also is your body react, trying to defend against this invader of, of light, um, and you can get yourself cancer, and that's when you do enough damage that your DNA, as it replicates cells, is, is the instructions in the DNA are messed up. So not to be, ta be taken lightly. Um, yeah, it's really, yeah, I, all day yesterday, it's dumb. Okay. So there's, uh, there's a picture of the black body curve of our sun. That should look familiar by this point in the year. Um, our sun maxes out in the visible. The yellow part of the curve, it, the yellow part is right in line with a normal black body curve, and that's the part that makes it to Earth because there's not much blocking, uh, there's not much blocking the photons coming from the sun to the Earth. But once it gets to the Earth, the red part of that diagram is what makes it down to the surface, and you can see that the atmosphere blocks out a lot. But there's these little atmospheric windows where if it makes it down, if it you can see that if the sunlight makes it down all the way down there, there, there's basically a window to that part of the spectrum. And you can see our, we've got ozone and oxygen and water and carbon dioxide that absorb a lot of that stuff that keeps it away from us, but then some of it makes it through. Um, I have another diagram of these atmospheric windows, which I think gives us a pretty good picture. That visible light, thankfully, makes it to Earth, so we can see. That's nice. Heat. In other words, IR, a lot of that makes it to Earth. That's, some of it does, that's nice. Uh, but then you can see that the long, you can see that the long radio waves are blocked out, but then of particular interest to us creatures is the left side, the gamma rays and x-rays and stuff like that are blocked out. But right as it's diving down, as that, right as that window is opening up for, for just the visible, that window just doesn't immediately do that. There's a little window for the dangerous stuff. and. That's the stuff we got to put on sunscreen and hats for. OK. Questions? Great question. How do astronauts avoid this? I don't, I, I don't know if um, that's common knowledge, that if you go into space, there's lots of things that could kill you. It's cold. There's no air. You know, It's not the most hospitable place. Uh, 
I think if you were just to make yourself a little rocket ship, you might forget, oh yeah, and also it's just crazy filled with uh, deadly radiation all the time. And so um, not only do astronauts have to be careful about that, so if you've ever seen a, a picture of an astronaut with like the gold visor that is protecting them from all that radiation and their suits have, so I mean it doesn't take a ton. I mean sunscreen does a pretty good job. So sunscreen plus a suit plus a visor, you can, you can um, protect yourself from a lot of that. And also they have to be careful about how long they're in direct um, sunlight. And so when they're inside the space station, space station also is lined uh, with materials that, that protect all that. But they, they definitely have to be careful with that. But they also, uh, when we set up satellites, we have to shield electronics from those types of radiation as well. And so humans are particularly susceptible to that. But I can set up a you know, billion dollar satellite up into space and forget to shield some electrical component from radiation. And that bombarding x-rays, you don't want to do that either. So you can take a really nice electrical component and bombard it with x-rays all day long and it's not going to get cancer, but it's going to get damaged. It's going to those will be ionizing radiation. You might probably want to keep that away from your processors or your hard drive, stuff like that. So um, that is important when you're in space to be shielded uh, from all that. And uh, your, the atmosphere does it down here. So as soon as you go above the atmosphere, you're at increased danger. In fact, as you go up to the top of a tall mountain, there's less protection between you uh, and all that nasty stuff. So just being higher up in elevation, you have to be more careful. Okay. Last class, I think we ended, uh, t we were just starting to talk about fluorescent light. And so as we're talking about light, uh, I think it was a couple classes ago, I brought up a slide. It'd be nice to know the difference between iridescence and luminescence and phosphorescence and incandescence. Um, we just started talking a little bit about fluorescent light last class. I just wanted to reiterate a little bit of how that works. That one light is still making like weird pink light. It's kind of funny. Um, so we've talked about incandescence. Incandescence is literally just black body radiation. It's just getting something hot enough that it glows. That's incandescent. So um, I think it was last class or the class before, I had an incandescent bulb up here, and we were able to use a diffraction grating to see the spectrum in that incandescent bulb. And an incandescent bulb makes the whole spectrum. It maxes out in the visible, but one of the reasons why incandescent bulbs are inefficient, and that's why we're trying to come up with better technologies, is a big chunk of what they put out is heat. You can't, if you're, if what you're, if the way you're trying to get light is by just getting something so hot it glows, you're also making that whole curve and you're gonna end up spending a lot of energy that's going straight into heat. That's why when you change a light bulb that's been on for a while, if it's an incandescent bulb, it's crazy hot. And unless you're trying to heat up your toaster oven or something, that's not a good use of electricity, it's just getting a light bulb really hot. And so we've tried to come up with other technologies. Today I want to get into two of them, just briefly, fluorescence, and that's what these are. These fluorescent tubes are just another technology we've devised to try to make light. Humans have been doing that for a long time. We figured out if you light stuff on fire, you can make light. Thomas Edison figured out if you get something crazy hot, it'll make light. And we did that for a long time. I'm glad we're finally coming up with some better ideas. Here's another idea. I can come up with these special uh, chemical compounds called phosphors that glow. And so the nice thing about a phosphor is I don't need to get it crazy hot. I just need to shoot photons at it and it'll glow. And so what's going on in these fluorescent tubes is I've got, and you can see in the picture, I actually have a nice inert gas like argon inside there and a little bit of mercury, which is already a reason why we should try to move past these. Mercury is deadly. And so I've got mercury in these. So um, I don't know about you if you're thought it'd be funny to like smash one of these over your friend's head, don't do that. It, there's mercury gas inside, so it could be dangerous, among other things. Um, and so inside there, there's mercury, and that mercury becomes gaseous inside that chamber. And what we're going to start talking about, hopefully, maybe by Friday, there's electric current flowing through there. And I can actually get these electrodes plugged into the power company, and I get electric current flowing through there. That electric current excites the mercury gas. And so we've talked about a few examples this semester of things that they get excited when they get excited and then become unexcited. That difference in energy is released as a photon. And so that's a big concept that's come up a few times in this class. Let's see if I have a picture of that. There it is. Um, I do want us to, that concept should be pretty familiar by now. The idea of 
when we're talking about atoms, electrons hang out at these orbitals, and that, that, that's connected to their energy level. And I can send in a photon, a little packet of energy, and that'll excite the electron. Those excited electrons now have extra energy. And when they release that energy, they get unexcited. That's released as a photon. And so that's what's going on in that picture. That's a picture of electrons absorbing and emitting photons due to their changes in energy level. So I've got these mercury atoms. Mercury is a nice, big, complex atom. I can send in a photon, get it excited, and the mercury atom is going to get unexcited and shoot out a photon. That photon that comes out is actually usually not in the visible part of the spectrum. And so that's why these lights are coated with the phosphor. So these mercury atoms are sending out invisible photons that wouldn't be very useful to us. But then they run into the coating, that white coating that if you've ever picked up a fluorescent tube, that white is actually just a white powder coating. The mercury photons hit that coating, and that coating glows. And so we've just come up with these various chemical uh, compounds that'll glow in frequencies vi visible to humans. And I think I mentioned last class that uh, if I know humans are going to be looking at it, I just need three compounds in there. I just need. Uh, I just need red, RGB, red, green, and blue. And in fact, you, if you ever go buy a box of fluorescent tubes, or next time you're at Lowe's, just look at a box of fluorescent tubes, even, even if you're not in the market for one, they're usually rated at a temperature. And uh, let's see, computer monitors sometimes have temperature. If you're ever in Photoshop, sometimes you see the word temperature related. And it's just the where the temperature is really a, the black body temperature. And so because I'm not using an incandescent bulb, I'm not getting a bulb 8,000 degrees. You, that's, great, that's too hot, like 5,000 degrees. What I can do is I can, I can sort of mimic 5,000 degrees with certain chemical compounds. So uh, just today, I happened to see on a fluorescent tube, it said 4,100 degrees. And so what they had done is they had actually figured out, where's my black body curve? There's a pretty good black body curve right there. They had figured out what the black body curve of 4,100 degrees looks like, and they just coated it with phosphors that would do a pretty good job mimicking those same frequencies. So if you, a human were to look at something that's 4,100 degrees and a human were to look at this light bulb, the human would have a hard time distinguishing the two because of the frequencies coming out. And so that's, what you, that's why bulbs are, nowadays are often rated at certain temperatures, because they're faking it. And so the LED bulbs and the... Floor, and the uh, combat fluorescents at the store are usually rated in certain temperatures. Yeah. Good question. So um, why do we kind of go through that process? Um, that process is the best one we've come up with, and it's not a great process so far. You know, so I, I, want I want phosphor to glow. And so I can get, I can get a lot of so the, the, the phosphors that we want to use don't glow. Well, we'll only glow with a UV source. I guess that's the way to say it. So the phosphors that we're using only glow with a, a UV source. So we need a UV source, and that UV source is, is excited mercury gas. So we kind of have to go through that two steps. So we want to excite a gas. And there's only so many options there. So we, we want to use an excited gas. But I, I think. So we have to come up with a gas that will get excited in the UV, because that's the phosphors we're using. So I guess, like, um, last class, right at the end, I had some tubes up here, like neon gas. Just, it just glows in the visible. So I, um, I could just come up with stuff that glows in the visible. And like, I think the football stadium has lights that glow in the visible. So there are gases that we can use, uh, like, uh, hi, what is it, halogen bulbs? They're, uh, that's usually it's, uh, that's something different. But there are gas we can use that just go ahead and glow visible. Um, but instead, because we want to mimic these certain frequencies, what we do is we come up those those we come up with these phosphors that will glow at those frequencies. But most of those phosphors, the input necessary is UV. So then we have to come up with a gas that glows in the UV. So it's a it's a little more complicated than we'd like it to be. Hence the next technology we're talking about. Yeah, Billy. Oh man, that's such a good question. Um, Billy asked about light pollution. So I'm going to pull up this picture, not that one. That, that one, the one that's at the back of every one of my slides. Um, so 
we happen to live, I don't think, yeah, this is not really in the context of this class, we happen to exist in a big spiral arm galaxy with billions and billions and hundreds of billions of stars. And it is the most beautiful sight because we're in a disk. If you ever look, if you look, if you look, if you look out through the axis of the disk, you're just looking at interstellar space. But if you ever look down the axis of the disk, you're just looking through billions and billions of stars in your own neighborhood. And if you've seen it in the sky, it's that bright band. In fact, the word galaxy is comes from the Greek for milk, if I remember right. It looks like a milky path through the sky. Um, and those stars are just faint. And so in order to perceive them, I there just needs to be a difference between dark and light. It's kind of, we've talked a little bit about those types of, I can't, I can't see something if there's just other things brighter than it in its vicinity. And so our, um, yeah, our atmosphere just reflects light. So all the particles in the air are going to reflect light. So if I'm in a neighborhood and it's totally dark outside, but, you know, Scott Stadium is down here and JPJ is over here and all this light is going up in the sky, I'm going to get a lot of that back. And what I'm going to see is that, and that'll sort of block out my ability to see the stars. Kind of an example of that, and this hasn't come up yet, but it, it does. This definitely pertains to what we've been talking about. Is like if and you're in an interrogation room, the FBI wants to view the interrogation, but they don't want you to be. They don't want to be seen. Similar idea. What they do is they put you in a really bright room, and they go hang out in a dark room. It's not that special of a mirror. It's just half. It's just kind of reflective. And so I can't see the FBI agents, not because their photons aren't making it to me, they are. But there's just too many other photons from inside the room. And so in the, when I'm in the room, that, that window, people call it a one-way mirror, people call it a two-way mirror. Neither of those terms make a whole lot of sense to me. It's just a half mirror. So about half the photons bounce and half the photons make it through. So when I'm in the really bright room being interrogated, there's so much photons in the room that it just gets in the way of my ability to see what's on the other side of that, uh, other side of the mirror. Turn off all the lights in my room, all of a sudden I can see it. And similar idea, turn off all my lights, I can now see those faint stars. And there's a lot of them. But turn on the lights in my room or just bounce other light off the atmosphere and all of a sudden my ability to see the galaxy is diminished a lot. So, I don't know, go out to Crozet or something. Climb up humpback in the middle of the night, something like that worth your time. Okay, let's talk about one other light technology, and then uh, we're going to get a little bit more into optics, which is just the bending of light, nothing too crazy there. Um, the next light technology, I don't know if, this happens, this happens several times in this class, it'll keep happening, I think, um, where we sort of start treading into chemistry. Chemistry is just applied physics anyway. So we start treading into chemistry. I don't want to get too deep into chemistry, but some, here's something you should know. Um, I think, hopefully you know, you are a carbon-based creature. Carbon turns out to be a really nice atom to make complex structures. We assume if we ever find some aliens, there's a good chance they will also be carbon-based. Not because we're so narrow-minded, we think they're going to be like us, but as we look around the universe, there's only a handful of elements, and not too many of them are great for making complex things like intelligent creatures. Carbon's a good one. The main reason carbon's a good one, it, it has four valence electrons, means it has four on the outside, and it can make this nice grid of carbon. And so if you look at an a organic thing, it's usually these long, complex carbon chains. Silicon is very similar. So if we ever meet another species, it'll probably be carbon-based or silicon-based. You could imagine silicon-based life I don't know if we found any on Earth, but silicon's the same way. These four valence electrons can make these nice, complex lattice structures. And so I have a picture of it of silicon up there. That's a chunk of silicon. And so you can, you can imagine a silicon atom just has four valence electrons, the dots, four dots, and then you take another silicon atom next to it and then above it, and you can make these nice structures. Okay. That's a picture of silicon. Silicon is sometimes called a semiconductor. Another word for semiconductor is pretty bad conductor. Because it, we're going to get more into electricity next week or two, but electricity is the flow of electrons. There are no available electrons in that picture. They're all used up in those bonds, in those atomic bonds. 
And so there aren't any of available electrons, so that's actually a pretty bad conductor, that picture right there. But if you were to get out a periodic, ta a periodic table, here's how you make, how you go from a semiconductor, which is just a bad conductor, to a pretty good conductor. You do what's called doping. And in a minute, I'll explain why we're getting into this. But you dope, you dope silicon by adding in these little impurities or extra atoms, for example, a p uh, some boron. So if I take a chunk of silicon and I shower it with some boron gas and it's just a little, it doesn't have to be much, like one out of every million atoms, all of a sudden a boron slips in there. If you look at the periodic table, boron is just one to the left, I believe, of silicon. And what that means is it's actually missing an electron. It only has three valence electrons. But it will happily insert itself in that structure. And so you can see in that picture, boron has inserted itself into that structure. And there's now a little hole, a little empty space that an electron could jump into and actually would want to jump into. That right there is what's called p-doped silicon. P-doped because it's, got a, it's, it's slightly positive. It's slightly positive because it's missing an electron. Electrons are negative. So far, so good. So I've got p-doped silicon up there. I can n-dope silicon as well. You might imagine what an n-doping looks like. I look at my periodic table, and I go one column to the right of silicon, and now I'm over with stuff like arsenic. And I can p-dope my silicon with some arsenic. And here's just the genius thing that some people figured out a while ago. I just think, still think this is one of my favorite human inventions. People figured out I can take some p-doped silicon and some n-doped silicon and just glue them together. It's that complex. So if you've ever heard of a diode, a diode is one of the simpler electronic elements out there. And it's just a chunk of silicon that's p-doped and a chunk of silicon that's n-doped glued together. That's a diode. And the great thing that happens when you do that is, well, a couple things. One, electrons only want to go one way through that little junction where you've glued them together. So when I've got my p-doped and my n-doped, I've got my n-doped has a little extra electrons. That's that picture up there. That one extra electron, that fifth valence electron in arsenic, that electron has nowhere to go. It's floating around in a lattice of all, all the other electrons are happy in, in the bond. I've got one extra electron that would like to go somewhere. When I glue that to my p-doped, it's got somewhere to go. It's the hole surrounding right next to that boron atom. So now I've got a structure that has extra electrons and holes. And it, I can drive those electrons across that junction from the one type to the other type. If I apply a little bit of voltage, which we'll get into what that means, but if I apply a little voltage across that device, I'll have electrons jumping across the junction. And every time an electron jumps across the junction, chances are the energy of that electron on one side of the junction is different than on the other side. Chances are it's going to drop some energy. And as we were just talking about, when an electron drops down an energy level, that energy has to go somewhere. It's going to shoot out a photon. And if it shoots out a photon in the visible part of the spectrum, we call that a light-emitting diode. It emitted light. It emitted light when that electron jumped down an energy level. That's a light-emitting diode. It's a genius device. It's just two pieces of silicon glued together. And when I send electrons marching across that boundary, every time an electron jumps down, it shoots out a photon. That is basically free light. That's why it's such a great invention. That's why there was a Nobel Prize awarded to the team that finally figured out how to make blue ones, because we needed blue. Otherwise, all our lights were yellow. So the guys that figured out how to make blue ones, they got a Nobel Prize for it. It's great. So instead of making something the surface of the sun, instead of making mercury gas, and those are complicated, and they're going to break them, all I do is take these little tiny, and they're amazingly tiny. You can fabricate them just impossibly small. And I just send electrons across there. Every time an electron jumps down, they shoot off a photon. The electron jumps down, shoot off a photon. And that little jump in energy is so, so small. They're very, very efficient little devices. And I can pack them in really small. And I'm, I'm sure that eventually that'll be, until we come up with some other amazing, I don't know what could be more amazing than that. But uh, that, I'm sure that's going to eventually light all our headlights, all our classrooms, all our monitors. And, and I mean, they're already lighting our laptops and cell phones and cool new cars have them now. Yeah. 
Yeah, so a diode is any time you just glue n-type and p-type together. And if you do it just right, light shoots out, and that's a light-emitting diode. So there's diodes. Diodes are little one-way valves for electricity. Light-emitting diodes are the particular kind that also emit light while you're at it. It's a nice just little bonus. Let's see. Any of them you could buy. So you could buy any type of diode off the shelf and put voltage across it, and the current will flow. But sometimes that's sometimes you you have there's other uses for them, not just emitting light. So you put run current, put a voltage and current flow. We'll talk about that later more in detail. But uh, some of them will emit light, but all of them will. You put a voltage across it, current will flow through them. The fl so current flows through any diode. But some of them emit light. Because the, so that was a good question. Why do some not emit light? So the light, the photon that gets released has to do with the energy difference. And so if that energy difference is small, you're hardly going to get any light out. Definitely nothing invisible. So you have to you have to specially you have to specially make your diodes such that the energy gap is just right. And so the di um, the LEDs that we use every day, I mean, they only emit one type of photon. So we've got red ones. So the gap is so big that a red photon shoots out. And like I started talking about today in class, the color of a photon has to do with its energy. So the low energy ones are red. So I get a little energy gap. I shoot red photons out. I come up with a different chemical compound, and I can get a bigger jump, and I can get green photons to shoot out. And it, was, it took us till I think, the 90s to figure out how could I make some chemicals that really had that big jump, because blue is a more energetic photon. And then as the, energy, as the electrons jumped down that big gap, I got blue photons out. And now we've got RGB, and now we can make Audis. So that was kind of that we had to wait till that could happen, or otherwise all our lights are red and green. And that's, that's not good for classrooms and stuff. Sure. Oh, yeah, so the, the chemical gap has to do with what, chem what, what compounds I've used to put together. So right now, like, for example, I used um, boron and arsenic. If I were to put a boron and a arsenic together, there would be an energy gap. And who knows if that'd be visible. I don't know. What this so we just had to come up with these really clever combinations of, of doping to make the energy gaps just the way we want, just to make these nice red, green, and blue um, photons. Yes, it's all, all just silicon. Um, we could get a little bit more. Uh, the textbook actually does a really good job to, uh, talking about um, bands, like Fermi bands and valence bands and conduction bands. So uh, if you want more information, there's some good stuff. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff in the next book. Let's, let's do an eye clicker before I forget, and then we'll start talking about optics. Okay, so we're going to start talking about optics for a day or two. I don't have a ton to say about optics, but um, really what optics is is just, I mean, we talk about, we've been talking about light for a couple weeks now. Optics is really just the bending of light, particularly the bending of light for us humans to take advantage of it, like glasses and things like that. Um, so we're also going to talk a little bit about the, how the human eye works. Here's your eye clicker for the day. Here's some trivia about the eye. The cornea, which is that thing on the front. Uh, which one of these is true? A, the cornea has no blood supply. B, red eye, which I think we're familiar with from photographs, is light bouncing off the back of your eye, which is the retina. C, the retina is a better identifier of, a unique identifier of humans than fingerprints. And then D, all the above. Let's take, pardon? Who keeps on plugging my base? There. It's closed. Oh. How about now? All right. Hmm. Someone is sabotaging my base.
15 more seconds. Nice work. I think most people figured that one out. It is all the above. The answer is D, all the above. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how the I works. That's our teaser into how the I works. Um, if to, to understand how an I works, we're going to have to talk a little bit about mirrors and lenses and reflection. Here's our simple, here, let's start with the simplest one. Let's see. I'm going to put up my. There we go. I'm going to turn down the lights a little bit. Nope. OK. So up on the, the right screen there, you can see just four parallel beams. So I've got a source of light up here with just four slits in it. I've got, not, I've got four parallel beams. We used that before to see refraction. So I can see that I can bend light. Uh, I can actually get total internal reflection. You're seeing some light actually bouncing inside there. Let's see. So this, we've already looked at these parallel beams. So I can I can use the fact I can use the fact that glass and acrylic are very clear, but have a different index of refraction than air. That fact is how is why light bends. So I can use that fact to bend light. So I can bend light using two transparent media, air and glass or acrylic, and the fact they have different indices of refraction allows me to bend them. Let's see. The easiest, and then I can also, I can also reflect them. So rather than just using, uh, I can also reflect them using a mirror. And I wish, do I have a? Yeah, okay. Actually, before I even get to the mirror, I can also focus them. And so if I'm if I'm careful, I can bend light, which we were just seeing. I can bend light, and if I shape my, if I shape the interface between the air and the, and the plastic just right, I can bend the light. And so there's, this is an example of a lens. We'll talk more about this next day or two. But there's a good example of the lens, where you can see that parallel beams are leaving that lens and converging at one point. That's the focal point. So that lens has a particular focal point and focal length. That focal length is yay big, about five centimeters or so, the distance from the center of the lens to where all those beams merge. That's, a, that's the focal point. Mirrors also have a focal point. And so you can see in this picture, in this example, I have to bend this down a little bit, that the parallel beams all merge at a common point. That's the focal point. And there's several good uses of that type of situation. Here's a good situ here's up on the, that screen, on the screen on the left, is a good example. Headlights are usually, Headlights are usually constructed by having one source of light, a very powerful source of light, at the focal point. And so a headlight is basically this situation run backwards. If I take a bright source of light and put it at the focal point, that will create omnidirectional light, light going in every direction. But as it, when it hits the mirror, all of the light will, will bounce off the mirror and go parallel, will merge parallel. So my, light, my headlight can make nice focused light that is parallel and can shoot out of the front of my car, and I can see what's going on ahead. And so a headlight, or a, a uh, like the headlights in my car are, do a pretty good job of that. They basically run this in reverse. So I've got one example of that up here. And that example, I actually have two examples of that up here. Here is basically a headlight. I have a light bulb. I don't know if you can see it there. I have a light bulb at the focal point of this mirror. So I've got a mirror up here, and at the focal point, there's a light bulb. So the light is going to go in every direction, but then it'll actually get sent parallel, and I'll have parallel beams merging from this, from this mirror. Those parallel beams will actually go all the way across the table to the, a very similar mirror here. Here is a mirror that will receive those parallel beams, and they, all those parallel beams will be focused on that match right there. So I've got a light bulb. It's not a crazy light bulb. It's your average, probably 100 watt light bulb. But if you take all of the energy emerging from your average 100 watt light bulb and focus it using a curved spherical mirror like this, I can focus it at one point. I should be able to light the match. So I'm just using your standard, normal uh, light bulb, 
But because I've got a spherical mirror here and a match at the focal point, all that energy will, should be concentrated enough that I can light that match. You can actually, I think it's, yeah, it's lit. There it goes. So that was just using focused light. So I've got light emerging from here focused on that match. I can do it one more time. Do that one more time. I'm sort of, I should not have looked at it. I'm sort of blinded right now. Um, let's try that one more time. I won't look at the match. So it's hard not to. I just want to know, there it goes. OK. So I was able to, right? Yes, no, it's, it was smoking. There it goes, definitely lit there. And just, yeah, there it is, it's lit, okay. And just for fun, what I'd like to try, I'm not gonna put my hand there, let's see. If I were to put, if I were to put a piece of paper right at that same spot, that piece of paper probably won't ignite, because this paper is white, and white, so white is reflecting too much light. But this, I'm just going to take a sharpie. Sharpie is made of pigment. Pigments absorb light. I, I'm going to see if that helps. Where that sharpie is? Yeah, I'm seeing smoke there. There it is. OK, so uh, maybe I'll put that on the document camera. But that's a pretty good example of, A, the focusing of light, but also what a Sharpie does. A Sharpie's job is just to absorb energy. So there's a picture of it where the, the pigment in the Sharpie actually just pulled in all those photons, and the paper burned where I had colored it dark on, with the Sharpie. OK, two minutes left. Let's just do one or two more demos, and we'll talk more about lenses and things next class. Um, let's see. Two demos that have to do with total internal reflection, and then we're done for the day. Um, just a couple fun examples of, I mentioned, I think, one or two classes ago, the way fiber optics works. So next time you Google something, chances are the data coming across the computer is coming from very, very far away at roughly the speed of light. Thank goodness we get figured out how to transmit data at the speed of light. And we use fiber optics to do that. And so right now, in this. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Is that visible from where you are? So I, I'm bouncing light through this. So this is just a clear uh, acrylic tube. But I can actually bounce light through it. There's a notch in here that I can shine light in. And that light is actually kind of, uh, I don't know if that's visible to you. Is that it? visible to everyone? But that light is actually kind of going around in a, in a spiral. And you can actually see the result as it comes out. You can see there's a circle on the wall. And this, that's total internal reflection. And basically, this is basically um, a fiber optic cable. It's kind of the same idea. And I can transmit data on that. I can flash it on and off. I mean, it's light, so it's, I've got a lot of um, pretty, pretty, low freq a pretty high frequency, low wavelength. And I can actually get light to bounce inside of fiber optics like that. Here's my last example, and then we'll be done for the day. This is. This is a crazy, uh, I, crazy UVA physics adventure. I've never seen this anywhere else but here, but I don't know whose idea it was to do this. Um, somebody took a flashlight, glued, um, this is a peanut butter container full of water, and drilled a hole in it. And so I've got a flashlight with a peanut butter container full of water and a hole in it. And the cool thing is, so when I pour it, I should get a nice stream of water out of that. And the light in the flashlight will be totally internally reflected, and it actually stays, it stays yeah, it kind of stays in the tube. So it's hard to see from where you are, but like, can you see where it's bouncing off my hand? I don't know if you guys can see. I, I could get on camera or something like that. So it's kind of crazy. It looks like, I don't know, magic water or something. That So it's just pouring out like water, but where it hits my hand, there's light. Can you see that? So basically, I'm, fill, I'm, I'm causing light to be directed just by the, stream of, by the stream of water. And so I can light up something, and it's bouncing inside that light just very similar to a fiber optic cable. Whoever's idea that was, kudos to them. I think that's awesome. Um, see you Wednesday.